My name is Stephanie Kelly, and I want to thank you all for being here today. And I know you're not here to hear about me, but I do hope you'll indulge me for one second as I tell you about the moment that I knew the Dollhouse by Fiona Davis was something special. It was last summer, and I was sitting in the passenger seat of a car, simultaneously freezing from the air conditioning and getting sunburned through the windshield. Physically, I would be stuck in traffic in that car for the next six hours. But mentally, I don't remember anything but those first few minutes, because it was during that trip that I began the dollhouse, and in spite of everything, was instantly transported into the Barbizon Hotel for Women, which was often called the dollhouse because of all the pretty young girls that lived there. It was a location and a cast of characters I never wanted to leave, and for that reason I couldn't be more excited to be introducing Fiona and her incredible debut novel to you today. The Dollhouse is a dual narrative that pulls readers into the lush world of New York City's glamorous Barbizon Hotel for Women, which is an iconic New York City land landmark located just a bit uptown from where we are right now. It's a building where a generation of aspiring models, secretaries, and editors live side by side while attempting to claw their way into fairy tale success in the 1950s, and where a present day journalist becomes consumed with uncovering a dark secret buried deep within the Barbizon's glitzy past. Both eras, and the Barbizon itself, come alive in the novel with rich detail and impeccable research, which is fitting given Fiona's day job as a journalist. She's a graduate of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and has written for magazines such as O oh, the Oprah Magazine, Women's Health, and American Way. But The Dollhouse is a lot more than well-researched. It's a smart, entertaining page turner with heart. It's simultaneously a mystery, a snapshot in time, a love story, a look at the power of female friendship, an ode to the city of New York, and an exploration of what it means to be an independent woman. The Dollhouse is a novel that captured me from the beginning, and I'm not the only one. You'll be able to read praise from authors such as Suzanne Rindle, Kathleen DeSaro, and Jules Moulin in your galleys. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce you to the author of The Dollhouse, one of the smartest, kindest, and most talented authors I've ever had the pleasure to work with, Fiona Davis. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Thanks, and thank you for having me here today. I am thrilled and honored. So a couple years ago, I was looking for a new apartment, and my broker took me to see the Barbizon 63 condo, which, as Stephanie mentioned, is located at Lexington and 63rd, and that once housed the Barbizon Hotel for Women. And the Barbizon was founded in 1927 as the go-to residence for cultured young ladies as they stayed and worked and, and studied in the city. The place had 700 rooms, spread over 23 stories, and after providing three references and getting all the appropriate approvals, guests were given a tiny little room. But the Barbizon's amenities rivaled those of the private gentlemen's clubs of the day, in like a solarium, squash courts, swimming pool, a private dining room. It was a refuge, a place where men weren't allowed beyond the public areas, and where even the female, um, the elevator operators were female. Dozens of icons lived in the building at one time or another, including writers like Joan Didion, Eudora Welty, Mona Simpson, and Sylvia Plath, who famously referred to it as the Amazon in the bell jar. Um, as well as up-and-coming actresses like Lauren Bacall, Grace Kelly, Liza Minnelli, Candace Bergen, Joan Crawford, the list goes on and on. And during my tour of the Barbizon 63, I was told that a dozen or so of the older residents had been grandfathered into the building when it went condo in 2005. And at that time, they were all moved into rent-controlled apartments on the fourth floor while the construction went on around them. Now, as a journalist for the past 16 years, I've been primed to perk up when a good story idea is thrown my way, and this one had me buzzing. So even if the apartment didn't really appeal, I, I wanted to find more about these ladies who would lived at the, at the hotel for decades and watched as the city's demographics, as well as those of the hotel's residents, dramatically changed around them. So I left polite letters with the doorman, um, asking the residents of the fourth floor for interviews, and I got no response. I was stunned. I, I imagine these ladies would be so eager to chat and share their stories. But in a way, it was a gift, because instead, my imagination took flight, and the work of fiction that is now the dollhouse began to take shape. 
Now that's not to say I didn't do my research. Journalism is my default mode. So whether I'm writing a story on the causes of heartburn or a Q&A with a ballet dancer turned marine, research is my default mode. And I, I love the process because at that point, anything is possible. And every new piece of information is a clue. And in the case of the dollhouse, the research opened up clues to the characters, the settings, as well as the major themes of the book. So the first thing I did was hit the Barnard College Library up on Broadway. I needed a window, a window into the world of the early 1950s, which is when I wanted to set it. And the library had shelf after shelf of back issues of women's magazines, all very carefully bound and, and by publication and by date. And I poured through the articles and the photos and the illustrations to get a, a general sense of the time period. And even the tiny ads in the back of each issue fascinated me. There was one for the ear beautifier which promised to pin back your ears if they stuck out and was <laughs> probably more of a torture device. Um, but I was drawn into these full page spreads of girdles and hats and colorful photos of women with impossibly cinched waist, wearing fabrics with names like Mallinson rayon and poodle cloth. But the articles in particular intrigued me. They offered conflicting messages. Like on the one hand, being a career gal is great, just don't take it too far. One article from 1951 offered a list of the best part-time jobs for women because working full-time cuts into the satisfactions of housekeeping. <laughs> yeah, the tone in general was that women were there to serve. In an article on how to behave when your husband brings home the boss for dinner, women were encouraged to not prattle on. And my personal favorite was a piece that offered advice to the newlywed, entitled Aside to the Bride. And that included wisdom like never touch your husband's razor or his desk. And the first time your baby cries and your husband calls for you at the same time, go to your husband. Nice. <laughs> but then I thought about some of my friends and acquaintances who'd stayed home to raise kids and were facing a crisis of sorts when those kids went off to college. Or others who got divorced and after years of focusing on the husband and the kids had to figure out what they wanted to do with their lives. So even if we were no longer wearing poodle cloth, many of us were still struggling. And I knew that was my way into the story. So I created two characters and two timelines. Darby, who shows up the, at the Barbizon Hotel in 1952, determined to do well at secretarial school and never marry. And Rose, who moves into the condo in 2016 and finds herself in a precarious position when the man she'd grown to depend upon is no longer there for her. And as the plot came to me, I continued my investigation, finding women who'd lived at the Barbizon in the 50s and 60s and interviewing them about the minutia of their lives. I basically used New York City as my petri dish when I, when I wanted to um, include a, a jazz club, a fictional jazz club I called the Flatted Fifth. I signed up for this amazing 12-hour class on bebop at jazz at, at Lincoln Center's Swing University. It was, it was terrific, as well as a way to procrastinate working on the first draft. <laughs> and I later learned there's a name for this state of intense delight brought on by in-depth historical research, and it's called Research Rapture. It's completely in it. However, once I had the research in hand, the plot came quickly, and I was ready to begin. And each day, I, weekday, I headed across Lincoln Center's plaza um, to the New York City Library of the Performing Arts to work on my laptop. There was something about that long walk across the plaza past the Henry Moore sculpture that put me in the right frame of mind to work. And especially in the summer when the heat rising up from the concrete made me very reluctant to venture back outside. Darby and Rose's stories grew to include a tragic accident as well as men who surprised and emboldened them. But the main crux of the book was figuring out how two very different generations of women 
could challenge each other's assumptions and beliefs. I expanded the role of the elevator girl who brings Darby up to her room the first day and created Esme, a Puerto Rican immigrant who becomes Darby's closest friend and shows her an unexpected and grittier side of the city that most Barbizon residents probably never saw. The book was a joy to write, and thanks to my extraordinary editor here at Dutton, Stephanie Kelly, it has blossomed into something I'm so excited about sharing with you. My hope is the book will remind all of us how drastically different life was back then for a single girl in the city and how far we've come. And also, how by examining the past, we can continue to challenge the traditional assumptions about aging, about feminism, and about women being in charge. Thank you.